Turn visit to the show is that wonderful actor who won an Emmy for his performance as Henry VIII in The Six Wives of Henry VIII. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Keith Michel. Thank you, dear. You mentioned uh, an Emmy. Mm -hmm. Apparently I did win it, but um, I wasn't here in America. I wasn't able to be here for the presentations last May and so far you know I haven't received it oh so that leads me to wonder whether in fact I did win it oh I know you did because I was there and I heard your name called out as a matter of fact if you want proof positive watch right there Keith Michelle Catherine Howard the six wives of Henry VIII and the winner is Keith Michelle Catherine Howard the six wives of Henry VIII Now I know that I positively won an Emmy. Mm -hmm. Question is, where is it? <laughs> well, the Television Academy has taken care of that. And tonight, at long last, Keith, it gives me great pleasure to present you with your Emmy. Thank you, dear. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you very much. Well, after six months, I still don't know what to say. Well, go on, say something, make a speech. This comes as a wonderful, if rather delayed, surprise. <laughs> However, I would like to thank everyone concerned and involved in the production of the series, of course, and particularly seven very special people without whom the award would not have been possible, Henry VIII and those six wonderful women. <laughs> Are you ready? Ready? Yes, I mean, have you got the tickets? Tickets? Oh, Keith, come on. Oh. Oh, yes. Jerry, hold it. Look after it. Don't lose it. Tonight, yes. we have two tickets to see an opening night. Tonight, we have two tickets. Come on. Seats one and two. Here on the right. Come on, Jimmy. Two on the aisle. How exciting. Starting. The lights are dim now, the curtain is parting, the show is beginning, and we have to arm the arm. I believe it's time we sat, please. Madame, would you remove your hat, please? This is the best place to be, for we want to see. Let's sit back and smile and do it with style, because we have to. One. A poem by A. A. Milne. Isn't he the author who wrote Winnie the Pooh and uh, Christopher Robin? Yes, of course. The King's Breakfast. Oh, yes, I remember that. Do you? Yes, I do. Of course I do. It was one of my favourite poems as a child. Huh? Let's, uh, begin then. The King asked the Queen, and the Queen asked the dairymaid. Could we have some butter for the royal slice of bread? Queen asked the dairy maid. The dairy maid said, Certainly, I'll go and tell the cow now before she goes to bed. The dairy maid, she curtsied and went and told the alderney. Don't forget the butter for the royal slice of bread. The alderney said sleepily, You'd better tell his majesty. 
Christian that many people nowadays like marmalade and sweet. The dairymaid said, Fancy. I went to Her Majesty. She curtsied to the Queen and she turned a little red. Excuse me, Your Majesty, for taking up liberty, but marmalade is tasty if it's very thickly spread. The Queen said, Oh, and went to His Majesty. <laughs> the butter for the royal slice of bread. Many people think that marmalade is nicer. Would you like to try a little marmalade instead? The king said, Father. And then he said, uh, Dear me. The king sobbed. <laughs> dear me. And went back to bed. Nobody, he whimpered, could call me a fussy man. I only got a little bit of butter for my bread. The queen said, There, there. And went to the dairymaid. The dairymaid said, There, there. And went to the chef. The cow said, Mmm. Oh, well, I didn't really mean it. His milk for his porringer and butter for his bread. The queen took the butter and brought it to his majesty. The king said, Butter, eh? <laughs> and bounced out of bed. Nobody! He said as he kissed her tenderly. Nobody! He said as he slid down the banister. Nobody, my darling, could call me a fussy man. But I do like a little bit of butter to my bread. <laughs> A penny's worth from the three-penny opera For a moment with good while From two on Zion Just a check, 
What's he applying for? Oh, it's about a computerized society yes. and the physicist yes. who is applying. Yes. Um, oh, why don't we just watch it? Oh. I mean, I have to explain to you. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, good morning, Miss. Are you Mr. Lamb? That's right. Good, good. Yes, you're applying for this uh, vacant post, aren't you? I am, actually. Uh, Are you a physicist? Oh, yes, indeed. It's my whole life. Oh, jolly good. Now, our procedure is that before we discuss the applicant's qualifications, we like to subject him to a little test to determine his psychological suitability. You've no objection. Oh, good heavens, no. Oh, good, good. Now, won't you sit down? Now, I just fit these to your wrists. What are they? Electrodes. Oh, funny little things. There they are. Now, these here. I say, our music. Yes, now I just plug into the computer. Plug into the computer? Oh, yes, yes, of course. You would have to, wouldn't you? This now, helps to determine my, 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 my suitability, doesn't it? Unquestionably, yes. Now, relax. Just relax. Don't think about a thing. No. Relax completely. Yes. Relax. Quite relax. <laughs> Would you say you were an excitable person? Excitable? No, not unduly. No, of course Would I... you say you were a moody person? Moody? No, no, no. I, I wouldn't say I was moody. Do you ever get fits of depression? depression. Well, I wouldn't call it depression exactly. Do you often do things you regret in the morning? Regret? Well, uh, but here's what you mean, what often? I mean, Are you often puzzled by women? Women? Men? Men. I, I just going to answer the question. Do you women. often feel puzzled? Puzzled? By women? Women? Men? Oh, no, 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 Unable to eat, unable to remain seated, unable to remain upright, lost in the way of heat, brandy, full of desire, full of energy, full of bread, drained of energy, of bread, of desire. Well, it's difficult to say, really. Are you a good mixer? Oh, well, now you touch on quite a little Do you there. suffer from eczema listlessness or falling coat? Uh. Are you Virgo intacta? Are you Virgo intacta? It's rather embarrassing. Are you Virgo intacta? I beg your pardon, I make no boast of it. Have you always been Virgo intacta? Always. Uh, from the word go. Go. Oh. Do women frighten you? Mm. Their clothes, their shoes, their voices, their laughter, their stares, their way of walking. Their way of sitting, their way of smiling, their way of talking. Their mouths, their hands, their feet, their skins, their thighs, their knees, their eyes, their toes, their... 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 Mr. Lamb will let you know. <laughs> Act 2, Scene 
one? From the taming of the shrew. Oh. Which role do you think is the more important, Petruchio <laughs> or Kate? Definitely Kate, of course. I disagree. Petruchio is my choice. Mm, that must be why they call the musical version Kiss Me Petruchio. <laughs> oh, sorry. But who did she kiss? <laughs> Too sorry. I will attend Kate here. And woo her with some spirit when she comes. Say that she rail. I'll tell her plain she sings as sweetly as a nightingale. Say that she frown. I'll say she looks as clear as morning roses, newly washed with dew. Say she be mute and will not speak a word. Then I'll commend her volubility and say she uttereth piercing eloquence. If she do bid me pack, I'll give her thanks as though she be stayed by her a week. If she deny to wed, I'll crave the day when I shall ask the bands and when be married. No, I will not. But here she comes. <clears throat> and now, Petruchio, speak. Good morrow, Kate. So that's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard, but something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine, that do talk of me. You lie a faith for you're called plain Kate. <laughs> and Bobby Kate. Sometimes Kate cursed. And that Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom. Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate. But dainties are all Kates. <laughs> uh, and therefore, Kate, take this of me. Kate of my consolation. Hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtue spoke of and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs. Myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Moved in good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you were the first. You were immovable. Why? What's immovable? A joined stool. Thou hast hit it. Come. Sit on me. Oh. The asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such jade as you, if me you mean. Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee, for knowing thee to be but young and ripe. Like... So vain as you to catch. And yet as heavy as my weight should be. Should be? Should buzz. <laughs> well taken, and like a buzzard. Oh, slow-winged turtle, shall a buzzard take thee? Aye, for a turtle, as he takes a buzzard. Come, come, you wasp, if ain't you are too angry. If I be waspish, best beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. Aye, if the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp doth wear his sting in his tail? In his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours, if you talk of tales and so forth. What? With my tongue in your tail? <laughs> I am a gentleman. Oh, that I'll try. I swear I'll cuff you if you strike again. So may you lose your arms. <laughs> if you strike me, you are no gentleman. And if no gentleman, why then no arms? A herald, Kate, or put me in thy books. Well, what is thy crest? A coxcomb? A combless cock. So Kate will be my head. No cock of mine. You crow too like a craven. <laughs> <laughs> come, Kate, come. You must not look so sour. <laughs> oh, it is my fashion when I see a crab. Oh, here's no crab, and therefore look not sour. There is, there is. Then show it me. Oh, had I a glass, I would. But you mean my face. Well aimed of such a young one. No, by St. George, I'm too young for you. Yes, you are with it. Just with cares. I care not. Now hear you, Kate. This you escape not so. I chafe you if I tarry. Let me go. No, not a whit. I find you passing gentle. It was told me you are rough and coy and so. <laughs> and now I find report a very liar. Yes. But now I gave some pleasant passing courteous. Yes. Oh, slow in speech. <laughs> Springtime flowers. Thou mm. canst not frown. Thou canst not look scared. Nor bite the lip as angry wenches will. Nor hast thou pleasure to be cross in talk. <laughs> but thou with mildness entertains thy wooers with gentle confidence, soft and affable. <laughs> Why does the world report that Kate to the limp? Oh, <laughs> slanderous world. Kate, like the hazel tree, is straight and slender, as brown in you as hazelnuts, and sweet as the kernels. Let me see thee walk. <laughs> 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 Thou dost not hold. 
Go, fool, and whom thou keep'st command. <laughs> Did ever Diane so become a grove, as Kate, this chamber, with her princely gate? Oh, be thou, Diane, let her be Kate, and then let Kate be chaste, and Diane sportful. Where? did you study all this goodly speech? It is extempore, from my mother wit. A witty mother, witless else her son. Am I not wise? Yes, keep you warm. Mary, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed. And therefore, setting all this chat aside, thus, in plain terms, your father has consented that you shall be my wife. <laughs> your dowry agreed on, and will you nil you? I will marry you now, Kate. I am a husband for your turn. For by this light, whereby I see thy beauty, thy beauty that doth make me like thee well. Thou must be married to no man but me. Nor I am he, am the one to tame you, Kate. Kate, to a Kate conformable as a household Kate. I went to Venice to buy apparel against the wedding day. We shall have rings and things and fine array and kiss. <laughs> we shall be married a Sunday. Petruchio finally won Kate, they must have lived tempestuously ever after. No, no, I think the marriage was quite quiet. Hmm? She learned to do what she was told. She admit it's a complete reversal of real life. Oh. Mm -hmm. Do you think they'll do something less strenuous? The importance of being earnest by Oscar Wilde. Scene, a Victorian drawing room. Oh, what's the plot? Jack, who lives in the country, poses his younger brother, Ernest, when in London. Jack wants to marry Gwendolyn, but Gwendolyn only loves Ernest, little knowing his name is Jack. Oh, no, whoa, whoa, steady on. You mean Jack loves Gwendolyn, but Gwendolyn only loves a man that she thinks is called Ernest. Is that it? Hence the importance of being Ernest. <laughs> Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Oh, pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Uh, whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. Yes, I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. Oh, I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax. Ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I've ever met since I met you. Yes, yes, I am quite aware of the fact, and I, I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. Do you really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. Oh, my own Ernest. <laughs> yes, of course. But you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. I mean, you answer to the name of Ernest. You are the most earnest-looking person I have ever met. Oh, yes, it is. I do. I am. 
But supposing it was something else, do you mean to say that you couldn't love me then? Ah, oh, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, it has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Well, personally, darling, I, to speak quite candidly, don't much care for, about the name of Ernest. I don't think that name suits me at all. Oh, but it suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music all its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance. The charming name. Jack. No, there is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all. It doesn't thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they were all, without exception, more than usually plain. Besides, the Jack is a notorious domesticity for John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. Mm. No, the only really safe name is Ernest. Well, then, I... I must get christened at once. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we must get married at once. Married, Mr. Worthy? Well, surely you know that I love you. And you have led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you are not absolutely indifferent to me. Well, I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject hasn't even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? Oh, I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it only fair to tell you beforehand that I am quite frankly, fully determined to accept you. Gentlemen. What have you got to say to me? Well, you, you know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Oh, Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. Oh, how long you have been about it. Oh, you have had very little experience in how to propose, I'm afraid. I don't know. I have never loved anyone in the world as much as I love you. Oh, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does all the time. My girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I do hope you will always look at me that way, especially when there are other people present. <laughs> He's marvellous, don't you think? Extraordinary. Mm. Really. She's, uh, she's quite good, don't you think? Yeah. Well, she's being overshadowed by the dynamic presence of that man she's working with. Overshadowed? Mm. Well, I thought she was doing her best not to overpower him. Oh, I'm <laughs> Did you notice how, during some of her speeches, he had only to turn his head and all eyes were riveted on him? I noticed he resorted to some cheap theatrical tricks, oh, but they hardly deterred from her overall performance. Well, <laughs> poor fellow has to protect himself. She is stepping on his line. She's stepping on his line? Yes. Why, it's all the dear thing could do to get out a sentence without his histrionics destroying the author's meaning. I cannot meaning. stand here and listen to you cast aspersions on him. Well, neither will I listen to your male chauvinistic ravings. Good night. You can say it with more gusto than that. Yes. Good night. I'm a fire. Good night. Stop him. <laughs> Yes, it was a lovely intimation. She's going to fail, isn't she? On a clear day, you rise and look around you, and you. Glow of your 
taking in the leaves. We always take off the leaves in the fall and we put them back in the spring. You take them off and you put them on, the tree does nothing. The tree is supposed to take them off and put them on. This tree is aluminum. Oh, then it's not a real tree. There are hardwood trees and softwood trees and there are tree trees. What are tree trees? Tree trees are nine. Tree trees are nine? True, true. Oh, then true trues are four. Gotcha. <laughs> Anyway. Well, on the one hand, I'm a string of beans, on the other hand, I'm the corn on the cob. I think you're bananas. Thanks a bunch. At least we're not out of our gourd. And that's the difference between us. Everything we have is grown, homegrown, and everything you have is fake. Fake? First, take this aluminium tree. It doesn't grow. Trees do not grow. Trees are assembled. That's efficiency. That's dumb. When it rains, I grow three feet. It costs me a fortune in shoes. What's this thing? Pull it and see. What do you call this thing? Read the price tag. A laminated, plasticated, extruded polystyrene apple tree, $65, squirrels optional. Dry clean only, made in Taiwan, inspected by number six, keep out of direct sunlight, highly inflammable, extra apples available through your dealer, do not remove this label. There, and the fruits are interchangeable with the seasons. In the spring, we take off the wax apples and we hook on the bing cherries and the cling peaches. Then in the summer, we put back the apples and the kumquats. How can you remember all that? Simple. In the spring, there's the cling and the bing, and in the summer, there's the apples and the kumquats. The last part doesn't rhyme. I know. We're working on that at the factory. Oh, it smells off. I don't smell anything. That's what I mean. It smells off. Oh, that's because the fragrance is extra. Smell the flowers. Mmm, they smell real. Of course they do. I use a real spray. For lilacs, I use a lilac spray. For the orchids, we use an orchid spray. Sometimes I spray the orchids with garlic. 
keeps away the plastic bees. <laughs> Why don't they smell? Oh, they are factory seconds. They're the kind men buy for their wives. Would you like one? No, 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 no. Some other time. We really must be growing. You mean growing? No, whether we're coming or going, we're always growing. <laughs> oh, it's real. You can, no, you can eat it. Hmm? <laughs> you, mean, you mean they don't make this at the factory? No, no, it grows outdoors with sun and air and water. That's how we cut out the middleman. <laughs> Try it. Mm. See what I mean? Mm. And there aren't many real ones like that left. There's enough for now, that's all I care about. Oh, too many people feel that way. Well, I've got some more trees to do. Bye bye, thanks for this thing. <laughs> what about the future? What about. What about the little baby that's being born right now? What are you going to leave him? Will you leave him a forest without any trees? Black rivers that never run
A Noel Coward scene. Yes, let me see. They're doing Cavalcade, part two, scene five. Place? Aboard a ship. Time? About 7 p.m. Characters? Edward and Edith. That's all. That's enough. Atlantic, isn't it? Far too big. And too deep. Much, much too deep. I don't care a bit, do you? Not a scrap. Wouldn't it be awful if a magician came to us and said, unless you count accurately every single fish in the Atlantic, you'd die tonight? <laughs> We should die tonight. Mm. How much would you mind? Dying, I mean. I don't know, really. A good deal, I expect. Mm. I don't believe I should mind so very much now. You see, we could never in our whole lives be happier than we are now, could we? Mm, well, darling, there are different sorts of happiness. Oh, yes, but, but this is the best sort. Sweetheart. Mm. Oh, don't, darling, we are... We don't want any more of the stewards to know we're on our honeymoon. Well, why not? It gives them so much vicarious pleasure. Most of them have forgotten what it was like. 
Aren't all honeymoons like this? Exactly. Oh, Edward. That's rather disheartening. I, I do so want this one to be unique. Well, it is for us. Did you ever think when we were children and going to the zoo and to the pantomime and playing soldiers that we would ever get married? Oh, of course I didn't. Was I nice as a child? Horrible. Oh, well, so were you. <laughs> and so was Joe. He was vile. You always took sides against me. Oh, and yet we all liked one another, really. I think I liked Joe better than I liked you, but then, oh. but then he was younger and he was easier to manage. Dear, dear Joe, he was funny at the wedding, wasn't he? He's a liberal little beast. <laughs> he has no reverence, I'm afraid. Absolutely none. No, he's passing gallantly through the chorus girl phase now, isn't he? Gallantly, but not quickly. Mm. <laughs> well, darling, you took your time over it. Oh, no, no, it is. I mean, you had several affairs before you married me, didn't you? The light you? of my life shut up. You'd be awfully cross if I had, wouldn't you? Had what? Affairs, love affairs before you. Did you? Hundreds. No. I rather wish I had, really. Perhaps I should have learned some tricks to keep you with when you're tired of me and old. Well, I never shall. Tired of your tricks or no tricks? Yes, you will. One day you're bound to. People always do. This complete loveliness that we feel together will, will fade. And so many years in the guilt wears off the gingerbread. And just the same as the stewards, we shall have forgotten what it was like. Answer me one thing truthfully, Miss. Did you ever see gingerbread with guilt on it? Never. Oh, the whole argument is disposed of. Anyhow, look at father and mother. They're perfectly happy and devoted and always have been. Mm. But they had a bit of chance at the beginning. Things weren't changing so swiftly. Life wasn't so restless. Well, how long do you give us? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Edward, I don't care. This is our moment, complete and heavenly. I'm not afraid of anything. This is our own for forever. Uh, do you think a nice warming glass of sherry would make it any more heavenly? Oh, you have no soul, darling. But I'm very attached to you. Saturday evening. Also starting next week, just before us, is a new series called A Touch of Grace, starring Shirley Booth. On our first show in the new time period, my guests will be Jim Neighbors and Edie Gourmet. So won't you join us please on our new night, Saturday, January 20th, at our new time, 9 p.m., 8 p.m. Central Time.
of Julie Andrews Hour. This is Dick Tufel. Jack's back. And tonight as guests are actor Robert Morley, comedian Kelly Monteith, and country and western singer Loretta Lynn on Jack Parr Tonight. Don't miss the Julie Andrews Hour as it moves to a new day and a new time next week, Saturday at 9, 8 o'clock Central Time, with the same sprightly entertainment Julie has been bringing you all year here on ABC.